Nokia has outlined a quote new strategic direction, boiling down to signing up with Microsoft to produce Windows Phone phones in 2012 onwards and reducing development of Symbian over the next year or two, giving my self-confessed favourite smartphone OS an effective end-of-life date, sadly. Symbian will continue into 2013, but I'm not expecting too many new devices, and probably not more than another six to nine months of firmware updates. Series 40 feature phone development will continue as is, it seems. Another mainstay from earlier in the decade, Palm has gone completely with HP launching the WebOS-powered Pre-3 and dropping the Palm name. The Pre-3 is a big upgrade to the unloved Pre and Pre-2 with a 3.6-inch WVGA display and a scorching 1.4 GHz processor. There's the usual sliding keyboard plus Wi-Fi GPS and the usual specs including 720p video capture. Samsung has announced the Galaxy S2 with a larger 4.3-inch display, Gulp, now using Super AMOLED Quote Plus. With better actual resolution, the Galaxy S used a pentile display matrix that cheats ever so slightly. Android 2.3, one gigabytes of RAM, 1080p video capture and NFC built in, as on the Nexus S, also made by Samsung. Amazingly, the Galaxy S2 is only 116 grams and 8 millimeters thick. Impressive. Acer has got even sillier with its Iconia Smart, which has a, wait for it, 4.8-inch screen with a 21-9 aspect ratio and a resolution of 1024 by 480. Apparently the idea is that you can see websites at full width. Let's also hope they ship a magnifying glass with it so you can actually read site text. Oh, and it runs Android 2.3 and has an 8 megapixel camera. Sony Ericsson has been busy announcing the Xperia Pro, a side slider with 3.7 inch screen and the usual including 1 GHz processor and Android 2.3. The Xperia Neo, a more traditional tablet phone with HDMI out, N8 style, and the really rather different Xperia Play, uh, an Android side slider that extends to reveal PlayStation control, shoulder buttons, D-pad, touchpads, etc. There's a 1 GHz CPU and an embedded Adreno GPU to power the 3D mobile gaming. Games get loaded via Sony's PlayStation Suite, currently under development. Breaking up the form factors, I was very glad to see Motorola bring the Droid Pro to Europe in the form of the Motorola Pro, with permanent QWERTY keyboard Android 2.2, plus business features like remote wiping, quick office and VPN. This has to have been one of the hardest reviews I've ever had to do on the phone show. The Nokia E7 is the latest in theory in a long line of Nokia communicators that have been my staple for almost a decade. And as such, it should have been a no brainer to recommend this as the latest and greatest smartphone on the planet. But it isn't. I know before you ask, the reasons why are on the whole nothing to do with the recent announcements about Symbian's impending doom. At first glance, the E7 is stunning, really. A four inch clear black display, that CBD that screams quality in all light conditions with a super satisfying and solid hinge mechanism. HDC, eat your heart out. The QWERTY keyboard that gets revealed is top notch too with one of the best phone keyboards I've ever used. Discreet keys, perfect feel, sensible layout. What's not to love? However, the form factor is not just the unique selling point of the Nokia E7. It's also part of the problem, the need to have a mechanism and QWERTY keyboard and yet keep the overall thickness of the device to 13 millimetres, stunning though it is from, a, from an engineering point of view, has meant a few compromises which, in my opinion, have hit real world functionality. The two big ones are camera and memory. With only five millimetres to play with underneath the keyboard, Nokia has had to use a tiny EDOF camera, that's extended depth of field. The photos it produces can be quite good and in the right hands produce decent results, but there's no way to shoot macro subjects or business cards or to get in any way arty. Maybe that's part of the business focus and an acceptable compromise. Video capture is quite decent actually. Here's a clip. And this is test video on the Nokia E7. Eat off camera, pretty good for video though, and excellent sound quality as you'll hear. It is shot in very weak winter sunshine, Nokia E7. I was somewhat distressed to see that the camera glass actually 
scratch resistant plastic is fully flush with the bottom of the phone no recessing at all so there's bound to be dirt dust and damage as you use the e7 on your desk sliding it around that's not good if the camera isn't an issue for you, then consider memory. Nokia claimed that there was no room here for a micro SD slot, meaning that you're stuck with just the 16 gig mass memory. Now, two problems with this. Uh, even 16 gigabytes isn't enormous these days. For example, I like to carry around about that much worth of music plus maps and another few gigabytes of videos. It's far too easy for the power user to run out on the E7. Secondly, with no card slot here, you can't use a micro SD card as a way to expand memory and also transfer media and files from your E7 to a desktop or to a printer or to someone else's phone. I do this quite a bit on the N8, it's very useful. Instead on the E7, you have to bring along your USB on the go adapter plus a micro SD or SD card to USB adapter. It's just a bit of a mess compared to having it built in. There are other compromises, though arguably less critical. There's no FM transmitter. Maybe there wasn't room for the aerial. Uh, the battery's fixed is on the N8, but there are no screws here for removing and replacing it in an emergency like on the N8. And this is a little worrying. Battery life is pretty good, but I like to always have a contingency plan. All the above aside, the hardware is generally excellent, though I didn't like the, the nudge volume and zoom control here. The NH rocker buttons are far superior. The display is again Gorilla Glass and the main unibody is aluminium and will survive a lifetime of use with ease, as will the hinge, which is all metal, partly explaining the 176 gram weight, almost as heavy as the HTC Desire Z. The software is Symbian 3 and despite the lack of fashionable Web 2.0 apps, nowhere near as bad as some media would have you believe, although it's fair to say that it would help enormously if you were already a Symbian or S60 fan and knew what to look for and what to add. Uh, and web and email are, yes, a bit sluggish. It's a shame such core components are still waiting for a big performance update or even rewrite. And while Nokia's at it, I did notice several display quirks and bugs, all seemingly linked to the new QWERTY focused landscape switch when you open the hinge. Nokia has promised continuing updates to its Symbian phones despite their long term plans, so I'll stay optimistic for now. As a communicator, the E7 has the full editing version of the latest Quick Office apps. I did note that the N8 also now has these with its latest update, again weakening the comparison, I'm afraid, against the E7. Ovi Maps shines on the E7 as always, though don't preload too many country maps because of possible disk space issues. Nokia social networking should be decent here, but the review E7's version is old and we're still waiting for an update to 1.3, sadly. The E7 shines at general multimedia with a screen popping up at a nice angle to watch videos on that large and lovely screen. Games work really well too with a hefty amount of HD games now in the Obby store, including, yes, Angry Birds. For game sound and for podcast or internet radio listening, the speaker on the back here down at the bottom isn't as good as the N8s. Apparently size was again an issue and it's smaller, but it's still better than the likes of the uh, Desire Z for one, perhaps its main competitor. Compromises aside, it occurs to me with apologies to Nokia's designers that virtual keyboards and auto word correction have now got so good on iOS, on Android, and yes, even on Symbian 3, that maybe we don't need hardware QWERTY keyboards after all. Yes, it's great to see the whole screen while you're entering text. And yes, hardware QWERTY will usually Trump virtual in a real world race with a mixture of text, names and numbers, but not by much, which is the point. I'm not sure it's worth accepting all the compromises I've just been talking about, all form factor driven when you could have the N8, for example, with more expandability, more capabilities, more options in a smaller and lighter device. Don't get me wrong, the Nokia E7 is a lovely device and it's sure to get better as Nokia carries on working on its software but it's ultimately flawed, at least in terms of what a 2011 Converge device can offer me, and maybe you as well. There was a tongue-in-cheek post on All About Symbian last week in which the poster talked about an upgrade to the E7 with loud stereo speakers, better autofocus camera, micro SD expansion, dedicated core application buttons for web, calendar, messaging, email, a larger screen. Wow, yes, you guessed it. They were talking about the 2007 Nokia E90, now a dinosaur. Such talk has got to hurt the E7's designer. He's worked miracles to produce this design in the face of steep, steep odds, but he's fallen short of the expectations of the long-term communicator fans like me. This is the Nokia E7.